Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. This is your brother Nafis Abu Zaid. And here with me today, alhamdulillah, at the Mektaba Ibn Taymiyyah, Free Public Islamic Library of Philadelphia, we have with us Brother Isa Abu Isa, and as well as a former graduate of Umu Kora, Ali Davis, our esteemed guest and colleague, by the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala, uh, also a part of the organization known as Al-Thamarat, who is currently an active to this present day and calling to the calling to the way of Allah Jalla wa Ala um, upon hikmah and as well as beautiful exhortations by the permission of Allah. Today we will be conducting an interview with our esteemed brother Ali Davis, inshallah, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him and as, all, as, well, as, as well as forgive us as well and to place this on our scales, inshallah ta'ala, as a way of encouragement and inspiration for those who uh, would like to study. Our brother spent a sense of time overseas, Allah, inshallah, and benefit from many scholars. So inshallah ta'ala, today, we would like to um, at least pick his brain a little bit, inshallah. Uh, brother Ali Davis, can you please give us a little background about yourself and who you are? Uh, you mentioned uh, background, studying wise? Yeah, just a little bit of background about yourself in terms of uh, who you are, like where you came from. Uh, uh, Ali Davis, born and raised in Philadelphia. Uh, Left to go study Islam uh, in 2000, the end of 2004, beginning of 2005. I got accepted in the Umu Qura. Uh, was, I was there up until the end of 2014. Um, graduated from the College of uh, uh, Judicial Law. And um, prior to that, I have a degree in um, information technology. I used to work in the IT field for several years. And um, Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me to go study. So that's what I did. Alhamdulillah. All right. <clears throat> it says here, Brother Ali, he said, how about some of your academic accomplishments? What well, kind of just mentioned it. Yeah. Gra graduated from uh, Umu Qura. Yeah. Uh, and also, I just mentioned it. Just answer. Yeah, just answer. Okay. Um, the can you at least elaborate a little bit more about the judicial uh, college that you graduated from? Um, yeah. So the the college of uh, judicial law, Qada. Uh, when I first started out at Umar Qura, I was in the uh, College of Sharia, and initially I didn't even want to study in Sharia. We was all headed to Kulia to Hadith, the College of Hadith. Um, we actually spoke to um, Sheikh Wasiya Allah Abbas. May Allah preserve him. Mm -hmm. he, he advised us, you know, to study Hadith. And um, so, you know, we were all intrigued on studying Hadith. And then uh, there was another Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Majid al uh, We used to sit with him for a, a, a whole lot when we first got there. And uh, he... He kind of advised us to study in the College of Sharia. And so we would ask him why. And he said one of the benefits of studying in the College of Sharia is that you will learn how to worship Allah from when you wake up in the morning until you go to sleep at night. Um, he said that everything that a person does, there is an Islamic ruling related to it. And he mentioned, you know, when you sleep, when you wake up, when you sleep, when you leave your house, when you go into your house, when you go out to go to work, and so on and so forth. So every aspect of your life. And he said this is something that you all need, especially coming from where you come from. It doesn't mean that we don't need hadith. Not. But he said, in his opinion, we were in more need of those things. And so I said, okay, if we go to Sharia, then maybe we could study hadith outside outside of the university with the Mashaikh. And so, alhamdulillah, we were able to do that. And so I went, I started off in the College of Sharia. And when I got into the College of Sharia, they had a department in Sharia called Qadha. 
that had a, a department in the College of Sharia called Qada. This department at the time, it was only one other American brother in, in that college. And it was said to be one of the, the stronger colleges in the university. And so, but I wasn't in that department. I was in the Sharia department. And so during that time, uh, while I was in the College of Sharia, I would always see the sheikh that actually told me to go to Sharia. He didn't teach in Sharia. He taught in Qadha, mm -hmm. that, that, the other department. So I went to him one day. I said, sheikh, why did you tell us to study in Sharia, but you teach in Qadha? And he said, because Qadha is actually more than studying Sharia. I figured if you can just get to Sharia, that's better. Because if, if you can't do that, how, will I, how can I ask you to come to Qadha when you can barely want to do Sharia? <laughs> so I said, subhanAllah. So then... I started asking him more about that department, and I found out that the classes were a lot smaller, so the Mashaik had more time to spend with each individual mm -hmm. student to go over issues. Mm -hmm. And I was always one to ask a lot of questions, yeah. tons of questions. Yeah. And so, in fact, they even, when I was in the Mahad, the, some of the, the teachers had a nickname for me. They called me Abu Indiswa. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 the father of the one who has a lot of questions. I have a question. And so when um, when the opportunity presented itself to transfer to that department of Pala, I transferred. Um, they didn't like to allow Western students to go into that department because most of the most of my colleagues would graduate and become judges, like in Qatar, yeah. in Kuwait, and even some in Saudi Arabia. And so before I transferred to that department, I called um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Aqil, Rahimullah Ta'ala. He was known in the Mimlika to be from the, the Sheikh of Hanabila. He was like from the biggest scholars of the school of Imam Ahmed. He was also from the students of Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Sa'adi, Rahimullah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very old. And I asked him, I said, Sheikh, you know, what advice do you have for? a brother in America, from America studying in the, the College of Judicial Law. And he said, well, how would this benefit you in your country? I said, I don't know, Sheikh, but I do know that they focus more on the school and certain issues that they don't really focus on in Sharia as much as they did. And you get more one-on-one -on -one studying. You get to study some additional books that they don't study in other departments. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, if you could get more benefit, then go for it. Mm -hmm. And so I did it. And so I went into that department, and uh, when I first got there, uh, we studied a book in Usul called Nihayat al Sul al Isnawi. Um, this book is probably a very, very difficult book to study in Usul. And in fact, the department was a bit intimidating because most of the Saudi students that was in there, they were very strong in everything. And coming from the Arabic program, and going straight into one of the hardest departments was a, a uphill battle. And so, alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me to have some Saudi companions that would just take me under their wing and keep me up all night and review and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easier because of that. Then, as time progressed, they shut that department down and created a whole separate college for the College of Judicial Law. So at that time, I was the first... Um, student to act American student that is to actually graduate from that college of judicial law and then after that came Abu Sajid so Abu Sajid and nine is another brother that also finished from that college um, so yeah how many lot you know if I can go back to study again I would yeah. if I can go back and spend more time studying because studying this slam never ends yeah. it never ends in, in spite of what you think you know is still a whole lot you don't know. No. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, um, nah. what made you pursue knowledge abroad? I mean, you was already a graduate from a college here that was already in uh, the state. What made you say, okay, I want to learn Islamic knowledge now? Like, I want to apply, and, so, you know, to an Islamic college or something like that. Um, so one of the things that that made me think about studying Islam was um, when September 11th happened. I was at work. I, used to, I was working in the D.C. area, and, you know, I would come to work with my phobe and all of this, and um, some of my colleagues at the time, they, they asked me, they said, look, 
we know you're a Muslim, but we don't understand Islam because especially what's going on with all the terrorism mm -hmm. and this, that, and the next. And at the time, honestly, I didn't really understand either. And in fact, I, I said to myself, how can I be Muslim and not really know anything mm -hmm. about Islam? And I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I didn't want to say I believe in Islam, but then there's certain aspects of the religion I didn't know. No. So that sparked my interest. And so I made Hajj that year, or the year after that I made Hajj. And that, that was really the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then one and another situation happened. A friend of mine, uh, we were talking, I remember, this was like in 02, 03. And he, was, he said that um, he had went to Chester Master of Fajr, and because at that time there were some students of knowledge that came. At this time, I was living in Maryland, and there were some student of no students of knowledge that came, but I didn't go with him to the masjid. So when he came back, I said, "What the heck? What I'm like? What in the world is a student of knowledge? Like, what's that?" Mm. He's like, "Man, these are the guys that, or the people that actually go and study Islam with the scholars." And I said, "Well, dad, how do you become one of those people?" Mm. And so that was another thing that kind of like intrigued me to say you know what that's something I would like to do it wasn't necessarily you want to go study Islam and come back and teach it was just you just want to learn Islam for yourself yeah. no. just so you can you know practice Islam better another thing that made me want to study was that I got tired of asking questions to brothers to ask people for me to call scholars and get yeah. responses that I didn't understand the answers to if you recall well, during you that time yeah, like, mm -hmm. it, there's nothing wrong with the brothers that were doing it. It was just that I wanted more information. Like, it was times I recall, you know, you have personal issues in your family, and you say, you know what, brother, can you call the shake? And they'd call the shake, and the shake uh, uh, say whatever he's going to say, yeah. but then you want some more detail. Well, yeah. why? Well, where do you get that? Well, show me. And the translator or the person that's calling, maybe they don't want to go that far. Maybe they just want to ask the question yeah. and maybe they're not going to ask it the way you would ask it. Or maybe they're not going to dig into the issue the way you would dig into the issue. So these are the things that I used to look at and say, yeah. you know what, I, I just want to get it myself. No. And so, you know, that was one of the things that made me also want to go study. Alhamdulillah. It says here, <clears throat> what, what would you say was your most difficult time during your time spent abroad? Difficult time. Hmm. Um, in terms of studies? Yeah. You, like, it, not in terms well, of studies. In terms of living abroad. Living right? abroad. Living abroad. Like, living things abroad. that may happen in those countries and stuff. Because they, they're obviously different than America. Yeah, definitely. So I could say some of the struggles was uh, could have been just adjusting. You got kids with you. The, the adjustment was um, it was real. Did you undergo any physical hardship? Yeah, like, like physical exertion, sick, sickness, or, or uh, alhamdulillah. Now sometimes, like I think a lot of times, those due to stress. Okay. You know, stressed out. You're in a foreign country, um, no family. Okay. Uh, one of the things about the students that, that lived overseas, it's like you become like a family because at the end of the day, it's like you all you have. Yeah. Okay. Right. You all you have. So things happen over there and you couldn't call them about it except for maybe your neighbor, except, you know, or a brother or, you know, whoever the case may be. Um, but in terms of difficulty, I can't say that. It was different, no doubt. Challenges, no doubt. Difficult, it was what I wanted. So okay. I can't say yeah. it was difficult, but, you know, what part of your studies did you struggle with learning and retaining the most? Like what part in your Islamic studies? Mm. What science was probably like the hardest? Yeah. Usul. 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 Yes. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it was hard, but it was. It was rewarding. Okay. It was hard, but rewarding at the same mm -hmm. time. Another one was um, not hard, but you got to really be on top of it was uh, inheritance. Inheritance, because it, it requires you to, you know, be on top of it yeah. every day. Like right mm -hmm. now, if you were to ask me some crap, I don't know anything right now. It like leaves your head yeah. if you're not reviewing it. Yeah. So, some, so with regards to um, Islamic inheritance, you got to sit down and go over that again and again and again. And if you're not on top of it, it'll leave you. 
And so you got to go back again yeah. and get it, you know. So it, and it's some math involved. Uh, a lot, no, some, a lot, a lot of math, a lot of math. So a lot that's of like math. the awesome of it is math, yeah, right? Yeah, math. You gotta. So imagine someone passing away, and you have to figure out all their family members are qualified to inherit, and then not just that they inherit, but how much do they get? Yeah. And then how do you break it down if it's something like a house? You can't split a house in pieces. So how do you liquidate it? And when it comes to liquidating, if a person gets an eighth, what's an eighth of a house if they don't want to sell? It's a whole lot of the issues involved with that. Yeah. A whole lot. How many is uh, the deed is complete? No. What? What? What part of your study did you struggle? Which of you? Which one of your teachers? Which one of your teachers influenced you the most? Who influenced me the most? I want to say Sheikh Abdul Majid Subayu. Because he was the, 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 the I'll tell you, um, I learned so much from him because he, he spent a lot of time with us in the beginning. You know, when you first go overseas to study as a, as a new student, a young student, you're scrambling. You're scrambling, who's, who are you going to learn? Every week you're hopping in a new class. And sometimes the classes would be a lot of students, mm -hmm. a lot of students, and you're just trying to get in where you fit in. But Sheikh Abdul Majid, he actually took time out. It was only teaching two of us. So we had time with them. We could really get our questions off. And we didn't have to worry about looking stupid. If we read and our reading was messed up, it just corrected easily. And he yeah. would spend time with us. Yeah. And, and another benefit we got from him was just his mannerisms. It was like unreal. Coming from where we come from to meet people like that. And he was like, in a way, it was like our first impression of good mannerism mm -hmm. in a way that, mm -hmm. you know, it was amazing for us to even be able to meet with a person like that and to benefit from them on, on, on such a close, um, a close base. Like we're really close in yeah. terms of like you know, sitting with them and asking questions and them being patient with us. And I remember one time we were, um, I think it might have been like our second or third year, but we really didn't get into any real technical issues. Yeah. And so. A sister had contacted us or contacted me and said her husband was uh, committing fornication. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how do you know? You know, she said, well, because she found some underwears or something in his in his robe or something like that. So I said, oh, man, this dude, was, you know, he's tripping. So I told the shape, I said, shake, you know, the situation, the brother committed fornication. And, you know, she said, well, how do you know? Well, she found underwears in his in his um you know, his stove and yeah. stuff like that. He said, that doesn't mean he committed fornication. I'm like, what do you mean? Shake, we know this is what it means. He said, a lot. And then that was like a, a learning thing for us. He said, no. He said, in order to do this, this one I first learned, you need to have this, you need to have four witnesses, you have to see, and blah, blah, blah. It was a whole spiel. Uh -huh. and, the, and the way he educated us on it, he didn't tear us down. He just said, you have to be careful when it comes to speaking about the religion. You can't speak about things you don't know unless you have knowledge about it. Mm. And so at that point in time, I realized from me just be quiet. Because I was all in on her side. This brother, I can't believe he did it. And she was, he was like, no. If anything, the only thing you established was that he had somebody's underwear in his pocket. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm. That's not, you know, so that was that was one of the first um, benefits. Yeah, that, that, like a strong benefit that I, I didn't forget. Are you still in contact with him to this day? I haven't spoken to the Sheikh in about six months or so. So it's been some time. Can you tell us about a time when you learned something or have a realization through an experience? I mean, it was similar to it, but where you had like a aha moment, so to speak, like. Yeah. Um, before before I graduated, uh, I had the opportunity to. Um, I was really close with some judges in Mecca, and. Uh, we were going to Medina, and he told me, he said, listen, before you leave, we're going to finish a whole bunch of al-Kafi from uh, Ibn al-Qudam. And so the whole ride from Mecca to Medina, we sat, one judge was driving a truck, and we sat in the back, and we read for four hours straight. Matter of fact, the whole weekend, mm. we, we, we stayed in a hotel, we, we read from Mecca to Medina, when we got out the car and carried our bags in, we're reading. When we got in the hotel, when we're reading, I said, man, I'm going to just go as long as the shake can go. If he can go, I'm going to go. Because I wasn't going to be like, all right, shake, let's stop. I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
And so he kept going. I said, I'm going to keep going. He kept going, and I'm going to keep going. Then eventually, all right, let's go get some sleep. And so I'm tired now. Mm -hmm. And so I know you asked me one question, but I'm going into something else. Um, and so when we stayed in the, the hotel room, like my bed was here, his bed was next to me. So the whole time, I'm like, man, I'm in a room with a shake. I got my one eye open looking at him, watching what he does before he goes to sleep. And uh, he got up and started praying at night. I said, Dad, that's decent. But I didn't want to get up and follow behind him. I just wanted to, be, I'm, but I'm just taking notes like, wow. And so as we was reading El Caffey, the next morning, we were still reading for three, four days straight, just reading El Caffey. <laughs> and we got to a point, he was explaining to me why Ibn Qudam actually wrote El Caffey. He said El Caffey is a book that was written for scholars. And it's an exercise book in a sense that if a person, and it all goes back to usul, when a person is learning Qiyas, this is one of the best books to use to teach you how to use Qiyas. And so he showed me example after example after example in El Kafi, how to pick everything apart and show how it's being used. Mm. And I was like, wow. Like I said, I didn't even. Mm. And so every single issue in there, you can use it for a kiosk. All right, look, this goes with so this. the whole this. time you're reading it, the whole it's time, like, yeah, it's like. He's training. Yeah, he's training me on how to read the book. What benefits you can mm -hmm. take from this book. So that was, no. that was beneficial. That was like an aha moment. Like, ah, okay. No. Uh, it says, uh, here is, I see that you are part of an organization known as Afamara. Mm. Do you care to explain to the people what it is and how it came about? Um, so Afamara was something that um, Abu Sajid and myself, we started, I think, back in 2010. 2009 or 2010. And the purpose of it was just to, you know, preserve translations. Put out, you know, little things that we can... You know, mm -hmm. you put it on the internet, something that we can always go back and review later. Like, okay, we, mm -hmm. and um, even more so recently, we he and I used to talk when we was in school, and we would mention like how, you know, life is short. We we had one of the, one of one of our professors in school. He said to us, he said, you know, many or than that don't live that long. He said he mentioned like the man never we died in his forties. Sheikh Al Islam passed mm -hmm. away. I think it was in his sixties. A lot of early men don't live that long. And he said, you guys, he said, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give you another 30 years. Maybe. 35, maybe. Maybe less, maybe more. And he said, how are you going to spend your time? Like, what are you guys going to do with your time? Especially when you go back to America. Are you guys going to be from those who busy the people with things that won't benefit them in their lives and in their akhirah? Or are you going to do something that's, going, that's tangible that they can use and help them get closer to Allah? And so he and I, we talk about that a lot. And he said, okay, if we use whatever things that we have at our resource to educate people and not get into any nonsense, any foolishness, but teach the people concrete knowledge that they can take and benefit from, mm -hmm. then the purpose of it, when, we, when we're dead and gone and we still have things that are available online that people can learn, perhaps that could benefit us while we're in our graves. Mm -hmm. And that's something that that we think about when we, inshallah, when we do what we do. Mm -hmm. So if you can give any advice to the Muslims living here in the West to be able to best practice their religion, what would it be? Stick to the Quran. Stick to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read it. Don't let the Quran collect dust. Learn it. Spend your time learning the book of Allah. Read in tafsir of the Quran. Everyone claims to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, but no one reads the Quran. And no one even reads Sunnah. How many people read Bukhari and Muslim and the uh, Qutb of Sunnah? Most brothers don't read. And it's like, how, how can you follow the way of the Salaf and you don't follow the way of the Salaf? The way of the Salaf starts with the Quran. It starts with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to become acquainted with the Quran and familiarize ourselves with it. Read it. Um, try to memorize it. Try to learn how to read it correctly. Many yeah. brothers can't recite al Fatiha correctly. The Asif. And it's something that we should be ashamed of. Many brothers cannot recite Al-Fatiha. And Nabi alayhi salatu salam, he said, La salata li man lam yaqra bi Fatiha til kitab. No. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, there is no salat for the one that does not recite Al-Fatiha. And so we, we read in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
that the salat tanha an al fahshai wal munkar wal bagi that the salat it protects people from committing lewd acts and disobedience to Allah but then you might find brothers praying every day but they're still falling into these acts so you have to ask yourself do you believe what the Quran is saying or you're not if you believe what Allah is saying then a person is going to ask us why are they keep falling into these sins it could be that they can't recite Quran properly mm. they might not be able to recite al fatiha they might not even know how to make wudu properly basic things that everyone or a lot of people seem to belittle but yet, or they, uh, I don't want to ask about that, I already know. But in reality, people don't know. And so you want to create an environment. You want to create an environment where people aren't scared to ask. If you don't no. know something, no. it's okay to say you don't know. Let's come learn. Let's come get it. No. So my advice to the people, stick to the Quran. Learn your religion. Stick to Tawheed. Learn how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Not associate partners with him. And that's 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 my advice, and Allah knows best. No. <clears throat> Among the callers here in Philadelphia, did, did you come across any of them in your studies abroad? And if so, can you please elaborate? What do you, what do you mean the callers here? The students? Yeah, I mean the guys who own the member, the brothers who I guess they give classes and things like that. I mean, I mean like listen, that. whoever studied in Mecca or Medina, we know them. No. We studied with them, we came across them throughout our time, and alhamdulillah. Any of them were you close with? Did you have some, some we were close with, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I mean, how close were y'all? Really some, some of us, <laughs> <laughs> some of us were really close. Alhamdulillah. Some of us were really close, man, and you know, as they say, man, the more you learn, man, people differ. You know, may Allah pardon us all and, uh, oh, I mean. and unify the hearts of the believers, man. Amen. I mean, I mean. Nah. I what mean. is your advice for the Muslims here in the West on how they should receive their brothers Tahir Wyatt and Muhammad Ibn Munir? Tahir Wyatt and Muhammad Ibn Munir, I, I, I'll say this. I, I've said it before. Um, in my opinion, they're two of the best people to come out of Philadelphia. I don't, and I'm, I'm a student. I study the slam. I'm not saying I'm the strongest student. I may be the weakest, but students know students. Just like doctors know doctors and lawyers know lawyers. People that study a slam know the people that study a slam. And I don't know anyone from among us that's stronger than those two brothers. No one. No. And, um, you know, and I was just, hock is hock. I don't know any other brothers that study with us that I know. Um, that are stronger than Tahir or Mufti. No. Either one of those brothers. May Allah preserve both of them. Um, it, it's enough. It should be enough that when the brother Tahir, may Allah preserve him, no. when he uh, when he got his master's degree, Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr was there. No. And he was crying. And we have this, we were there. He was crying. He was saying that, you know, he started out as a student and now he's from among us. There's a statement of Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. And he said this in front of the, everyone that was there in the room. And, you know, and Mufti's, his brother is diligent. You look at his hadith disciple. Mm. The proof is in the pudding. Mm. You know, so, you know, anyone can sit back and claim, well, he doesn't know me. Yet. The proof is in the pudding, man. Put up or shut up. Yeah. I mean, put your work out. From the brother myself. Yeah. I mean, we, listen, there was times um, with both of those brothers, we would. We would study all night, mm -hmm. we review, we call them, they call us, we go over issues and just learn benefit. We overheard that um you and Muhammad Manir used to have a lot of monocasha. Yeah. Like good monocasha, like good going back and forth. It was time to get the books out when he came. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when Muf when Mufti would come to Mecca it was war. It was war. We didn't we didn't take no prisoners. Okay. Sometimes we would we would like tag team them, triple team them. Um, but you know, yeah, that's you know, that's what we used to do. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised them. No, Allah raised brilliant. them. And another thing I, I would say, I would advise people to believe what you see. You know, unfortunately, man, we have people afraid of a boogeyman syndrome. Everybody, oh, stay away from it. look, man, the proof is in the pudding. What do you see? You know, you people sometimes people talk about these brothers or that brothers and well, like the early mass say, look, let's look at their works. Wow. Let's look at their works. The Salaf, they will look at the person's works. What did he put out? What, you know, oh, he said to me in a private conversation 30 years. Well, what is he producing? What works does he, what do you see? Mm. What's visible for the people to see? 
Very beneficial. No, no, subhanAllah. Look at it. Look at the works. If you find mistakes in a person, work pointed out. Ah, mm. this is a mistake here. It goes against these principles. Okay, tell the brother first. Look, mm. Aki, if he made the mistake publicly, publicly refute it. No problem. Refute mm. the mistake. Let the okay the brother sees the mistake. Oh my bad, it was a mistake. Well, to the correct you. the correct position is this: Jazakallah khair to keep it moving. No, it's not personal, man. It's deen. No, Subhanallah. Um, have you received any advice from the scholars abroad on how to face the present day fitna here in Philadelphia and beyond? If so, what was it? I don't know. What's the present day fitna? The fitna, uh, I guess. Is the fitting between the different, I guess, the sides of the different people saying somebody's a deviant off the Well, it was mentioned that there are different fractions of the people that all call to the same call, especially mm -hmm. the thousand Salafia. You have our brothers there that reside in Southwest, you have our brothers there that reside down there in North Philly, you have our brothers that reside Germantown. here in Germantown and, and so forth. And it seems like uh, there is a current, a current theme amongst everyone is that stay away from people that are unclear. Even though they're teaching from the same books or they're calling from the same mistakes and so forth and everything like that. Uh, All right, so what you want me to say? What's, what, have any of your teachers, like in terms of going yes. back, have they advised yes. you on the have issue? They yes. Do, are they aware of the issue, first and yes. foremost? Busy the people with knowledge. No. When you when you busy people with knowledge, the knowledge is the light. Okay. Make that the, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't, Raise people. We raise the book and the sunnah, mm -hmm. and the understanding of the sunnah. Mm -hmm. Let that be the gauge. Everybody has to follow those rules: Quran, sunnah, and ijma, salaf al ummah. This is the rules for mm -hmm. every single Muslim. If a person is not clear or unclear, I, all right, where's the distractions from the Quran and the sunnah and the way to salaf? Hey hat, hey hat. Mm -hmm. Bring what you have. Otherwise, it's just. Like smoke in the wind. Just man. talk. Just talk. And so my, my but the thing is, for people that uh that don't know any better, I feel the pain. I can understand yeah. um I can understand a person that didn't study Islam and they're being put in a position where they may be ostracized yeah. from a group or what have you. I, I feel for those people. Because I I, I can I can I can kind of empathize with what they may be going through. They're going through. Yeah, and it's, it's sad. You know, it's sad. But this is, you know, you got to have good thoughts of Allah. You have to have good thoughts of Allah. And unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, we suffer from, a lot of people suffer from conformity. Right? Group think. It's possible. Somebody might hear some, don't, don't take from this one, that one. But in their mind, they say, you know what? I don't agree with it, but... I gotta follow along to get along. No, it's mm. right? And it's unfortunate, but this is a lot of people in society are Would like. Would you say that's that a psychological effect? It or could be. Social? There's a there's a there was a study done by um, uh, I think it was a sociologist. It's called the Ash Experiment. Mm. The Ash Experiment, and what it what it deals with is conformity of people, and it mentions something like people conform. To things that they may not agree with for a few reasons. Number one is that they will conform because they don't trust their own judgment. Mm -hmm. That's number one. They don't trust their own judgment. Yeah. Right? In, the, in their mind, they might think this is correct, but then if five people say this is wrong, they're like, well, maybe it is wrong. Mm -hmm. so maybe they, have no yeah, they, have no, they don't have certainty, so they don't trust their judgment. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, they know what they're doing is wrong. But they can't face the backlash of the people. No. So therefore, they'll conform. Is this similar to like uh, Abu, uh, Abu Talib when he said that, you know, I know the deen of Muhammad is the best deen, but. It could be along those best. I fear to be offensive to my four, you know. It could be along those best. Allah Allah. And that, and the, and that experiment is not absolute, but it was an experiment that was done. Yeah, it was done like in the 40s. Yeah, it was done like in the, I think it was done like in the 60s or 70s. Allah yeah. knows best. Yeah. What is your advice to the Muslims who reside in Philadelphia or the surrounding areas in regards to the free public Islamic library here at Mahaz I mean, benefit. Benefit. Um, I, I advise the brothers that nobody's perfect. No. You're not going to find anybody, any student knowledge, anyone, except that people want to make mistakes. No. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. No. He makes mistakes. 
but people should benefit. You shouldn't let a person mistake unless it's not something that, you know, leads you to innovation, leads yeah. you to shirk, and other than that, you know, benefit. Learn. It's books here that people can benefit from. No, no. No doubt. I mean, the problem is you'll have brothers saying, yo, I don't want to benefit from that. But then you'll find these same brothers will never benefit from anything. No, It'll be won't. 10 years and you still can't recite al fatia because you don't want to benefit from the brother. Allah alam is hell had is that excuse yam shiyam al I'm not. Is that excuse going, you know, is that going to suffice a person on the day of judgment or not? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. This last question, inshallah ta'ala, this, this question here is not in alignment, it's a little bit off, so we still want your expertise and your advice from the ulama. I mean, alhamdulillah, it's, you know, I oh, myself and Isa, Isa. I'm going to put you on the spot. I have no expertise, man. <laughs> I, myself, and Isa Abu Isa have undergone a project called the Philadelphia Negro, based off the a what? case study called the Philadelphia Negro. Ne the Philadelphia Negro. Yeah. Based off of a case study uh, done by W.D. Du Bois in 1899. We would like to do a comparative analysis between the attitude, behavior, and social ills of black people during that time to our present day time, in hopes of identifying some where some or all of our problems might have come from, came from, thereby confronting the problem head on. By embarking on this project, we would like to do something similar to what Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab Ta'ala has done for the Arabs in his famous work, Masai'il Masai al Jahiliya, Aspects of the Days of Ignorance. He was able to go back in the history of the Arabs preceding the event of Islam and show them these behaviors and attitudes and social ills that, uh, that Islam came to do away with. And how, if the Arabs were to continue to hold on to them, then they would have not into Islam or heart. Our goal is to do some, do the same with the Philadelphia Negro. Uh, what do you have to say about this? You know, this project. Uh, what you? Uh, that's a lot. You just said a whole lot. <laughs> um, my my first advice would be consult some of the people in knowledge, get some assistance with it. Um, but here, I would also say that um, those types of issues, you know, how do you know someone didn't do research on that already, right? And I would also consult with sociologists and psychologists, people that actually mm -hmm. do that for a living. You don't want to reinvent the will. If the will was already done before, no need in doing it again. Look for those people that may have already put some work out and read everything you can about that topic. Mm -hmm. Also understand that that's not your area of expertise. It's not something that yeah. any of us specialize in or even have, you know, you might read one book here and there and think, boom, up, you're enlightened. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, but at the end of the day, you're talking about a field that people spend their life studying. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is to consult those people. Consult those people that um, know that field. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Another thing is, there's nothing wrong with using that to understand the ideology of a people in the area that you give dawah in. Understand the concept and where people at. I mean, in reality, here in Philadelphia, people suffer from a lot of social ills that unfortunately are neglected by many of us, many people in my position, teaching and in your position, our mm -hmm. position. Um, in this area, you guys call it Gotham City. It's one of the roughest parts of Philadelphia. Um, people dying on the streets every day right out here in front of your face and from drug overdoses and, and the likes, as you guys know. Um, so in my, in my humble opinion, I would just say, you know, seek counsel from people that know. This, this is not my lane, so I can't. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm familiar with the book. I'm, I read through the book several years ago, over maybe 10 years ago. I'm familiar with it. I'm familiar with other works as well. That you didn't mention, but that's not my area of expertise. No. But I'm not going to turn a blind eye and act like we don't have issues because mm -hmm. there are issues they need to be addressed. The thing is, you have to make sure that you keep the focus of Islam present, mm -hmm. and and ultimately, all of our issues, last check, no doubt, a lot of our issue, all of our issues go back to Tawheed. Mm -hmm. Everyone, you know, we say Tawheed, Tawheed, but in reality, it does now. We have to make Tawheed clear so that people can understand how it fits. You got to group all that together. You got to group, you know, certain 
ethnicity, African Americans, for example, issues with Tawheed and shirk, make sure they get that. To understand the social ills, you can't ignore social ills. No, you can't. You can't. You can't just say, okay, we're not. We're not. We're gonna uh, ignore the fact that this man was raised without a father. There's research done on men that were mm. that were raised without fathers. Yeah, studies definitely. show that. Mm. Studies show that most men that are incarcerated were fatherless growing up. Um, yeah, there's there's research on all types of things like that. So we can't ignore the fact that a lot of brothers and sisters in our communities grew up in single family homes. Some not even knowing who their fathers are. And a lot of men that uh, were raised in these types of situations, they have anger inside. Mm -hmm. Anger and animosity towards their fathers or towards them not having their father. Mm -hmm. And this also says another thing about Islam and that if a person loses their father, that's when they're considered an orphan. Not if their mother passes away. Yeah, this also shows the importance of the role of the father. If the no. father is not present, if a child doesn't have a father, or the father dies before they reach the age of puberty, this child is considered an orphan. No. It's considered an orphan in Islam. So, you know, that issue right there we need to address. How many, how many brothers and children walk around without fathers? And are angry. They and are angry. The and are angry. Mm -hmm. And they say children, or males that grow up without fathers, are more likely to join gangs. Mm -hmm. Huh? More likely to join groups. More likely to follow others. These are all character traits. Mm -hmm. You can't ignore that either. So then, yeah, in our inner city, there are many, many issues that need to be addressed mm -hmm. and can't be ignored. Um, mm -hmm. You can address them in ways through chutbahs and classes and slot it in one-on-one -on -one talking to people um, figuring out who they are knowing yeah. the audience who you're talking to get to know I mean you guys are here all day you guys see the problems yeah. Yeah. so yeah it means people here take the time and talk to them but at the end of the day you still want to seek counsel with some of the mashai that you studied with that you're yeah. in contact with seek counsel with them yeah. and explain to them the situation mm -hmm. sometimes like like Sheikh Abdul Majid would always tell us Ahlu Mecca Adra Bishiabiha the people of Mecca, they know their people better than anyone else. And he will say that about us being from here. We know mm -hmm. our situation better than anyone else. We, it's not possible for a person that's not from here, that don't know the culture, to know your culture here better than, better than you know, they know your culture better than you. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. But what you can do, you can explain to someone, okay, this is the situation. And if you say, yeah, they, they can know how through osmosis, how do they know? How? How is it possible? If you're not here, if you're not here, they used to tell, they used to say to, you know, this was a statement that brothers would say about students that's overseas versus the students that are home. They would say the students that are home are on the ground. They know the reality. The students that are overseas are not on the ground, which is true. No doubt. This is a true statement. It's true. It's true. So here in, as you guys call it, Gotham City, y'all on the ground here. Mm -hmm. Y'all know the problems in this, the problems in this neighborhood might not be the problems in another neighborhood. But y'all here, y'all know what, what the people need. And Allah knows best. But like I said, seek counsel, um, especially with people in the sociological, uh, sociology fields, um, psychologists, the psychology fields and the likes. Seek counsel from those people. It's brothers and sisters that work in those fields. They may be able to come down and set up a workshop, you know, bringing mm. people off the street, have them sit down here in the Mecca, counsel them, interview them, figure out what's going on with them, then come up with a strategy how you can help remedy some of their problems. And at the same time, you're teaching them a slant. What do you think the missionary, the missionaries do? They go to Africa and mm -hmm. spread Christian. They give them a couple dollars in their pocket and come follow their form of whatever they worship. Mm. Right? So you got people out here starving. Give them food. Huh? Give a food. Mm -hmm. Do a food drive out here one day. Give away food. Have people come in, learn about Islam, and teach them. No, Allah no. knows best. Not a full feature. Mm -hmm. Allowing mm -hmm. us to interview you, man. And uh, inspiring us with your, you know, your experience. You're acquiring knowledge. And inshallah, Allah may Allah raise you in the scale. Yeah, and bless you and your family. Inshallah, Allah bless you in all your endeavors.
Thank you for your piece of advice. No, you so uh, yeah. appreciate the light you keep it down from the night. You know, yeah. 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 a lot of light down here. You know what I mean? Brother came through. I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know.